Okay. Okay, so uh, we'll start back uh, now with uh, magnetic neutron scattering. And uh, I, I hope there's some overlap with uh, what we uh, just uh, discussed for inelastic scattering. Um, so this is actually, so my own, uh, my own area of research is mostly in magnetic neutron scattering. We're mostly looking at uh, exotic uh, magnetic materials, new magnetic materials, and new superconducting materials. Of course, we're also interested in, in, in phonons. Um, and actually, um, so th th this is what I'd hope to, uh, I'd hope to cover. Um, and I, I, I just wanted to um, impress upon you what a killer application neutron scattering uh, is to magnetism. Of course, I mean, neutron scattering is very, very important in, in many fields. Um, but, it, but in neutron scattering, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, you can measure this S of Q and omega uh, function, which uh, uh, embodies a lot of the, uh, most of the basic science that is of interest in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in magnetism. Uh, neutron scattering plays this uh, very important role that a, a, given, a given problem, you know, there's many problems that are essentially completely solved by, uh, by, by neutron scattering in, in magnetism. So, so it really is a killer application. I'm going to talk about uh, where magnetism comes from in solids, uh, how it comes about. And uh, I'm going to go. Th I'm going to do the same thing I did for inelastic scattering. I'm going to go through the cross section. But uh, and again, you know, if you like that, great. If you don't, don't worry. You know. And then I'm going to jump to some bottom lines, which are kind of guiding principles for how you would think about uh, neutron experiments. And and then I'll just go through uh, a few examples. And uh, actually, so so this here is a neutron scattering um, uh, profile, actually from a from a high temperature superconductor. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, what, what you see here is not just uh, uh, magnetic neutron scattering, but what you see at very low, um, actually you wouldn't know this, but, but uh, uh, so this is energy versus momentum here for a particular direction in momentum. And um, so this is at very low momentum transfer, and you're getting progressively higher as you go out in this direction. Okay? And so at very low momentum transfer, you tend to get magnetic neutron scattering, and then at high momentum transfer, you tend to get phonons, okay? And so uh, that's kind of the reason I, I chose to, to lead off with this. Uh, so, so, I mean, one of the bottom lines is that if you're looking for magnetism, you're typically lo looking at relatively low momentum transfer, and I'll talk about why that's the case. Okay. Um, so I thought I would start at the beginning, <laughs> okay? And... Uh, and uh, talk, about, uh, talk about magnetism in the context of, uh, of uh, its history, which is actually a very interesting history. Um, so magnetism has been around uh, forever, and of course, uh, just about everybody has some familiarity with, uh, with magnetism, because, um, uh, you know, it, so every, every, most people are familiar with fridge magnets. If you have kids, you know, their, their art is all over your fridge, and it's held up there with magnets. Those are permanent magnets. Okay, and uh, their materials like iron and such, which at room temperature are ferromagnetic. Okay, so the magnetic moments associated with iron, they all line up in the same direction. And the net result is that, you, th is that that whole piece of material, which makes up the fridge magnet or which makes up, say, uh, a compass needle, uh, it, it, it ends up having a net magnetic moment which uh, is due to all the iron magnetic moments pointing in the same direction. Okay. So iron, as you probably know, is naturally occurring, okay? and, uh, and, and uh, iron-based uh, minerals, minerals have been around for a long time. And in fact, so this is a, uh, this is a spoon from China from about 200 BC, um, which is made up out of uh, lodestone, and lodestone is just a mineral, it's just something that somebody dug out of the ground and, uh, and fired it up. And, uh, and made all sorts of pottery with it. And uh, actually, it's referred to as a south-pointing spoon because there's enough iron in here that the stalk of the spoon uh, uh, points south, actually. Okay. So, um, and, and so you know, these, this type of use of, uh, of ferromagnets uh, ha, you know, was documented you know, at least uh, 500 BC. And so people have known about it a long time and have exploited it for technology for a long time, right? They used it to, uh, to navigate. Um, so what's kind of interesting is that this form of magnetism is actually an uncommon form of magnetism, that most magnetic materials 
okay, are not magnetic as this ferromagnet is. They are actually antiferromagnets. That's much more common than ferromagnetism. But antiferromagnetism was only discovered in 1949. Okay? So there's close to, well, there's more than uh, 2,000 years between the discovery of ferromagnetism and the discovery of antiferromagnetism. And so that's a, that's a big difference, right? And so you might ask, you know, well, why, why is that the case? And that's the case because we didn't have the right tool to see antiferromagnetism, and that only came about with the, uh, uh, with the development of neutron scattering, you know, coming out of the Second World War. And so this is really the first uh, ob direct observation of antiferromagnetism in any material, and this is due to Clifshaw, um, a paper published in 1951, where uh, they did this uh, a very simple neutron diffraction experiment, okay, where they looked at uh, uh, a particular material, manganese oxide, at room temperature, and they measured this diffraction pattern at room temperature, and then they cooled the sample down to liquid nitrogen temperatures, so about 80 Kelvin, and they saw the development of these extra Bragg peaks. So there's an extra Bragg peak here, and there's these guys are extra as well. And, uh, and you know, so this was the first direct observation of the uh, ordering. I think I'm, I think this is now dead, by the way. <laughs> uh, if, uh, so if I can get, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so this was the, um, the first observation of this type of uh, magnetic structure. And so the magnetism is, so, is actually associated with the uh, manganese. So the manganese magnetic moments are aligning, but they're not all aligning parallel to each other. They're aligning in such a way that uh, there is, if you added up all the magnetic moments together, they would add to zero, okay? But still, it's an ordered structure. It's an ordered structure, and it gives diffraction. And so what Scholl was observing was not a phase transition from uh, a disordered magnetic state uh, to this ferromagnetic ordered state, okay, where all the magnetic moments point in the same direction. He was observing a transition from this disordered state to this type of an ordered state, where every up magnetic moment has down magnetic moments as neighbors and vice versa. Okay? So, uh, so this required, oh, thanks. So this required the development of neutron scattering techniques to see this, okay? So, I mean, there's a, there's a few interesting uh, things here. It just shows you the power of neutron scattering uh, in, in the field of magnetism. It also shows you that the, <coughs> the universe around us, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we see what we can see. We don't necessarily see what's there. We see what we can see. And if we, if we, you know, as we develop new tools, we can see new things and our view of the universe changes. So anyway, uh, interesting history. So, um, so, you know, so neutrons are, uh, as we discussed before, they're interacting with the nuclei in solids, but the neutrons uh, have a magnetic moment, so they will, they will see the electrons uh, only through magnetic neutron scattering, right? So you know, basically, magnetism associated with the electrons in solids generates atomic uh, magnetic fields, and the spin of the neutron interacts with that atomic magnetic field. Okay. And uh, so this is really quite different from either X-rays or electrons, where X-rays, you know, there's an, there's an oscillating electric field, or you can think of it in those terms. And so, you know, the oscillating electric field of the X-ray, you, know, uh, you know, sets the electrons into motion, and uh, it's a very direct interaction with the X-rays. And that's true for your electrons as well. Um, so, so this is the only way that neutrons see the electrons, okay? And um, so where does this uh, magnetism come from? So magnetism is uh, basically a consequence of having some net angular momentum associated with uh, an ion, okay? And to get a net angular momentum associated with an ion, you know, what you need is a partially filled uh, shell, a partially filled electronic shell. So what you need when you put magnetic moments together, or sorry, when you put atoms together to form a solid, you know, of course, there'll be some rearrangement of the atoms, right? You can, you can transfer electrons uh, back and forth. But when all, in the, all of that is done, when all the bonding and such is set, okay, what you're left with in terms of the ionic configurations or the atomic configurations, you know, if you have any partially filled 
um, electronic levels left, okay, then, um, you know, then there can be a magnetic moment associated with that. You know, so where are you going to find uh, magnetism? Okay, we know we find it in iron and cobalt and nickel. These are the things that make up ferromagnets. But actually, all these other materials are, or not all of them, but a lot of them are also, uh, are also magnetic. And basically, you find them when you've got a partially filled D shell or a partially filled F shell, uh, either 4F shell or 5F shell. So, so basically, uh, if you combine these sorts of elements into solids, Okay, you, you have the possibility for having uh, a magnetic solid because when everything is said and done, uh, you won't fill, you see you've got room for 10 D electrons. Okay? You've got room for 10 D electrons, you've got room for 14 F electrons. Okay? And if you don't have enough electrons to fill these shells, then there'll be some net angular momentum and there can be a net magnetic moment associated with that. And I'll show you how this works. Okay. So, um, so in magnetic insulators, in magnetic oxides, and a lot of what I study is magnetic oxides, uh, actually, uh, you know, this type of arrangement is actually very, very common. So this is what you would get. This is, uh, again, lanthanum cuprate. It's the parent compound for high temperature superconductivity. Um, but uh, the, the fundamental building blocks are these transition metal O6 octahedra, okay? I don't know how well you can see this, but there's supposed to be uh, a blue ion, which is the transition metal ion, sitting in the middle of this O6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 octahedron, okay? So the transition metal ion in this insulating environment, you know, feels the very strong electronegative environment from the oxygen 2 minus ions, okay? In this type of ionic crystal, oxygen is oxygen 2 minus, the transition metal is in some positive uh, valence state, and then we've got, uh, you know, lanthanum, which would be, uh, I guess, uh, 3 plus. Uh, as the green. And so the D levels associated with this transition metal ion, so there are 10 D levels in total. So they, there's a 2L plus 1. L is the orbital quantum number. L is equal to 2 for D electrons. So you've got, um, you've got five D orbitals, and every orbital can take an electron that's spin up or spin down. So in the presence of this very electronegative environment, Okay, those five d orbitals end up looking like this. Okay, so this is what the electronic cloud looks like, if you like. Okay, and these are referred to as eg orbitals. These are referred to as ttg, t2g orbitals. But uh, anyway, th the reason they look like this is that these low these low energy orbitals here, the lobes point away from the oxygen two minus ions, and here the lobes point towards the oxygen two minus ions. So they're just trying to they're just trying to reduce the electrostatic uh, energy. So, uh, so we can put two electrons into any of these orbitals, okay? And we'll do that in such a way as to minimize the energy, okay? And, uh, and so, uh, so if we have something like uh, 3D5, which is what you get when you have manganese, okay? Uh, then those five D electrons, you put one of, the, one of the five D electrons into each of these orbitals. That's what this is supposed to represent. And, uh, and this is because uh, there's, uh, there's what's referred to as a Hund's rule energy. So the electrons, if you put them in spin up, that tends to minimize the energy. If you, sorry, if you put them in all with the same um, parallel spin, that tends to minimize the energy. So you put one electron into each of these orbitals, okay, all pointing in the same direction, all spin up. I mean, there, were, were, there only were two choices for the spin, right? It's either spin up or spin down. But you can see it that, uh, you know, this gives you this has room for 10 electrons. And uh, if, if this is what you had for manganese 2 plus, okay, then you're going to get actually a pretty big magnetic moment associated with manganese 2 plus. It's going to correspond uh, to five aligned electronic spins. Okay? And that's, a, that's, a, that's five more magnetons. It's pretty big. Okay? So that shows you what you would get for manganese 2 plus. Here's another example. So this is the example that pertains to high temperature superconductivity. This is what you get for copper, uh, copper 2 plus, which is 3D9. So now you're, if you were 3D10, right, you would have two electrons in every one of these orbitals. Okay? But now you're one electron short from having two electrons in all these orbitals. But you can see what's happened is that uh, you know, once we get 
beyond five, we have to put electrons in spin down, right? Because you know it, it, it's spin up and spin down electrons. That's what you have for every orbital. And so if you put these together, you can see that the magnetism from all of these cancels out. Okay, the net magnetic moment cancels out for all of these. And the only, after it's all said and done, there's only this one electron spin that's left over. Okay? So for copper 2 plus, 3D9, right, there's only the, every atom has uh, the magnetism associated with a single electron. Right? So this problem is really a problem in extreme quantum magnetism. The problem of high temperature superconductivity and problems in quantum magnetism, they're really part of the same problem. Okay, people, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily uh, you know, term, uh, use that sort of terminology, but, uh, but, but that's, that's what you're left with when you've paired up all the electrons except for this one. Okay. So this, uh, so materials made up of copper two plus would tend to have a very small magnetic moment and uh, an extremely quantum mechanical magnetic moment because it's the magnetic moment associated with a single electron. Everything else cancels. Okay, so uh, what we're usually interested in is not the properties of single electrons, but what happens when you put them together uh, into solids and you get a, a magnetically ordered solid. Because you know the the reason iron was used, uh, you know, for compass needles and to navigate and such is because you know it wasn't because there was a magnetic moment on iron, right? That was important, but the fact that the iron magnetic moments on different atoms would interact with each other and align such that the net magnetic moment was very large, okay? And then it would actually follow the Earth's magnetic field and, it, and the forces were big enough that you could make a spoon out of it and the spoon would point towards you know, the North Pole. Uh, so it's these interactions that are important and it's often the case that what we're really trying to get at when we do these experiments is the interactions. We're trying to understand the interactions. Okay. And so this is, uh, you know, so this is kind of the simplest form for the type of Hamiltonian you can have. You could have an energy which is characterized by a single number J, and uh, it's just that the, the magnetic moments would, they, they either want to align parallel or anti-parallel to near neighbors. And if they align anti-parallel, then this is anti-ferromagnetism. If they align parallel, then it's ferromagnetism. And as I was mentioning uh, at the beginning, most materials are anti-ferromagnets. They want to align anti-parallel. There's no magnetic moment associated with them. You cannot use them as fridge magnets, okay? So, and that's why we didn't discover them until 1949. So if we have magnetic insulators, we uh, often have the case where the magnetic moments interact with each other via something called super exchange. And in this case, we've got some intervening non-magnetic atom, like say oxygen two minus, that, uh, that overlaps, has some overlap with the uh, magnetic uh, atoms, and it kind of mediates this type of interaction. Okay. Uh, if we, in certain types of metals, we, uh, we, we then have both local moments and uh, the electrons themselves have a magnetic moment. So the electrons themselves also have a spin a half magnetic moment, okay? And you know, in, in many cases, that spin a half magnetic moment is, uh, is random, okay? But in the presence of these types of local magnetic moments, the local magnetic moment can polarize the electrons around it, so it makes all their, all, all the electron magnetic moments kind of point in the same direction. And that polarization can get transmitted to the next magnetic moment and to the next. And so you have what's referred to as uh, an RKKY interaction where the local magnetic moment of a particular ion in a metal polarizes the electrons and the polarized electron cloud carries the interaction from one to the other. Okay. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter in a certain sense what the microscopic origin is of the interactions, although we might be interested in trying to figure that out. But usually, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. There'll be some interaction, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, there, these interactions, you know, result in some particular magnetic structure as being the low energy structure. And if it's the low energy structure, it'll end up as the ground state if you go to low enough temperatures. Okay. So, you know, this kind of shows you what goes on uh, in, in almost all magnetic materials, okay? 
And, uh, and actually, it, it really shows you in what, go, what goes on in all materials. It's just that magnetic materials are kind of a, a very simple version of, uh, of uh, they, they, they show a very simple version of this. So, uh, so what, what this is, is uh, th this is actually a Monte Carlo simulation. So again, if you know what that is, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. But it's a Monte Carlo simulation for uh, magnetic moments on a lattice <coughs> that interact with each other via a very simple interaction. And that simple interaction is, is this interaction where uh, we just take this to its logical extreme and we say that the magnetic moments, it's not that they're vectors, they, they're, they're degrees of freedom, uh, or if you like, they're one-dimensional vectors, they can only point up or down. Okay? So this would be referred to as an Ising model, it's the simplest possible model for any system uh, which has interactions in it. And, uh, and uh, you know, we would, we would choose that uh, J to be such that um, near neighbor magnetic moments would rather have the same near neighbor magnetic moment uh, as their neighbor. And so, uh, so we, you know, you can see you've got, uh, you've got uh, white squares and black squares, and you can imagine that the white squares are uh, spin up magnetic moments and the, and the black squares are spin down magnetic moments. Okay, so we know that, uh, we know that the, the system uh, would like to have, uh, you know, uh, upspins next to other upspins and downspins next to other downspins. And if we go to low enough temperatures, that's, that's really what you get. So at low temperatures, most of the magnetic moments have decided to be black, okay? So let's say black are upspins. So most of the magnetic moments have decided to be black, but a few of them are white because we're not at zero temperature. Okay, this is below the phase transition. But we also know, so this is in a, this is in a regime where energy dominates, okay? The energy is the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian wins, okay? At low enough temperature here. But if we go to a high enough temperature, and that's just right here, uh, then energy loses and entropy wins, okay? And if entropy wins, uh, that means that uh, we really have these quite uh, disordered uh, regions, okay? And um, you, know, you may or may not be able to tell, but here there's as, met, there's as much area taken up by the black spins as there is by the white spins. Okay? Okay? Uh, the black squares and the white squares are more or less the same. And they're not completely disorganized, right? Everything is in gray. Okay? And you've got islands of gray, uh, black spins and islands of uh, up spins, but they're, they're relatively small. And if we went to higher temperatures still, they'd get smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? So this is typical for interacting systems, okay? So, uh, so at, at high enough temperature, entropy wins. At low enough temperature, energy wins. <coughs> and, um, and then in between, there's a phase transition, okay? And, um, and the phase transition is actually quite interesting for a number of reasons. One is that it, at the phase transition, <coughs> the size of these regions, the size of these upspin regions and the size of the downspin regions they both will span the entire system, okay? So the science of, these, of this sort of phenomenon is at the phase transition is dominated by these very large scale structures, okay? And that leads to something called universality. And it means that, you know, the microscopic details, what makes a polymer different from, you know, a superconductor different from a magnet and so forth, you know, those, those, are, those are important differences, but they're differences that occur um, you know, at the, you know, interatomic and intermolecular length scale. If you go to big enough length scales, those don't matter anymore, okay? And so what universality says is that the phase transitions in kind of all materials can be understood in the same framework, okay? And uh, so there's an area called critical phenomenon which, which looks at this in detail. Um, but at any rate, Here's the energy-dominated regime. Here's the entropy-dominated regime. One of the things you can see here uh, is that um, black has won out over white, okay, here. Okay. But actually, uh, there's nothing in the problem that says black has to win out over white. And in fact, if you were to redo the problem, you know, white would win out half the time and black would win out half the time, okay? And the fact that it picks one over the other when we never told the system which one to pick is referred to as symmetry breaking. 
And that's another characteristic of a phase transition. So the phase transition always breaks symmetry. Well, it doesn't always break symmetry, but most of the time it breaks symmetry. Okay? And at low temperatures, you've got this energy-dominated regime. And so in the case of magnetism, okay, this ordered state is very simple. It's all the, mag all the magnetic moments pointing in the same direction. These are kind of more typical of the sorts of magnetic structures that you get. Okay? So, so really, you should think of this type of ordered structure as being these types of ordered structures. And there's a whole zoo of them, right? They can be very complicated. But that's what we're really trying to get at. We're really trying to get at what ordered structures occur at low temperatures and why do they occur. And the why they occur is if, 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 we, if, we, understand, if we understand this microscopic Hamiltonian, okay, th which is akin to understanding the forces between atoms, you know, then, we, uh, you know, then we can understand why the system chooses the ground state that it does choose. And if we understand why it chooses the ground state that it does choose, you know, we might be able to control that in some way that would be useful for technology. You know, so that's, that's the way these sorts of arguments go. Okay, so, um, yes, please. Yeah, so the question is, why is it a lower energy for the, uh, oh, so it's a lower energy for the, for the, magnetic moments to align parallel in the problem that I just gave, you know, because of the microscopic Hamiltonian, right? Because the Hamiltonian, um, the energy prefers neighboring spins to be parallel rather than anti-parallel, okay? But that's, you know, that, that, you know, I kind of set the problem up that way. So you might be asking, you know, why does nature want that, right? Is that what you're asking? Okay. So nature wants that because of these types of interactions. The, and, and this one that I'm drawing here schematically is referred to as super exchange, but there's, there's other types as well. But uh, it's, it's really a manifestation. So we're talking about the properties of electrons. So um, even though we don't explicitly say it, everything boils down to um, the, Cou the Coulomb interaction between electrons. Electrons are charged particles. They have Coulomb interactions between them, but they're also quantum mechanical pro uh, uh, they're also quantum mechanical entities, and they have uh, a spin a half, so they're fermions, and so um, the Pauli exclusion principle applies to them, and uh, no two electrons can end up in the same state. So actually, if you combine the Pauli exclusion principle with uh, just Coulomb repulsion, you get these types of interactions, which are referred to as exchange interactions. Okay. So, uh, where they come from microscopically is kind of really in the details, but they, for, for magnetism, they, ha they tend to have these relatively simple forms. Okay. But the, the, it's, uh, it, so it's in part what nature gives us, you know, given, uh, given the Pauli exclusion principle, Coulomb interactions, and that's about it, actually. Okay. Right, so... Uh, so the neutron itself, so if we're going to think about, you know, how the neutron interacts with magnetic materials, we've got to think about the properties of the neutron. So we said before, it carries no charge, so it's not going to interact with the Coulomb, but via the Coulomb interaction directly, but it's got the spin a half magnetic moment, and uh, the spin a half magnetic moment gives, it, it, it gives rise to uh, a net magnetic moment, okay, which is given by, you know, this uh, nuclear uh, gyromagnetic ratio, the, the nuclear magneton, okay? So this is, this is very similar to uh, the quantity that characterizes uh, the spin of an electron, except for it's, the, it's not the electron mass that appears here, it's the nuclear mass. So this is much smaller than, uh, than uh, the electron uh, magnetic moment, and then, uh, a spin a half degree of freedom, that's the Pauli spin operator. So this is the magnetic moment of the neutron, and it's going to, uh, you know, so what's gonna happen when it falls incident on the beam, uh, sorry, when it falls incident on the sample, and we're gonna do the same thing that we did for the inelastic scattering, we're gonna calculate a cross section, and we're gonna ask, you know, the same sort of thing, so what fraction of the neutrons scatter from the sample after you know, inducing some, or, or, or having some change in their momentum induced. I'm gonna write this as kappa now instead of Q, just to confuse you. Okay. Uh, so kappa is uh, the incident wave vector minus the scatter wave vector, and then there's gonna be some change in energy, right, as well. So, you know, again, we're gonna be interested in 
the amount of momentum transferred to the sample, the amount of energy transferred to the sample. And we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to write down Fermi's golden rule, and we're going to write down a double differential cross-section, just like we did before. So the neutron is going to go from some incident wave vector k to some scattered wave vector k prime. In principle, the spin of the neutron could flip or not. Okay, you could go from sigma to sigma prime, and the state of the sample can change from lambda to lambda prime. Okay, and that cross-section uh, has these three terms to it. And actually, this was true uh, when we were talking about phonons as well. There's a kinematic term that's out front that is you know, just determined by the nature of the, of the scattering experiment. It doesn't have anything to do with either the neutron or the, uh, uh, or the sample. Okay. Uh, then there's that matrix element squared that I talked about before. So, and now the operator that's in this uh, matrix element is the thing that tells us, how, so this is what tells us how does the neutron interact with magnetism in solids. We're going to have to put that in. And then there's an energy conserving delta function. Okay, this just says that, that at the end of the day we have to conserve energy. Okay. So actually, so this, this part is sort of given to us. This is conservation of energy, and so the science is all in this, uh, is all in this uh, matrix element. Okay, so, so how do we understand that? Okay, so we've got to understand uh, how the magnetic moment of the neutron, so this is supposed to be the magnetic moment of the neutron, how it interacts with the magnetism associated with the electron. Okay, and actually, the electron can have two sources of magnetism. It can have and it, it must have a spin, um, uh, a, um, it must have magnetism due to its spin, but it can also have magnetism due to its orbital motion. Okay, so the electron is a charged particle, so if a charged particle goes around in some sort of a closed cir circle or a closed loop, anything resembling a closed loop, then that generates a current in a loop, and a current in a loop will generate a magnetic field. So Electrons moving in anything like a, a circle will generate uh, an orbital magnetic field, and just the spin of the electron itself generates uh, this dipole moment of, uh, associated with uh, the electron. Okay? So there's, electric, sorry, there's magnetic fields that are associated with either the spin of the electron or its orbital motion, and these magnetic fields will interact with the spin of the neutron, and that interaction is just a dot product interaction. Okay, that's a very simple interaction, but that's what we're describing. Okay, and uh, actually, did I skip something here? No, okay, yes I did. So this is the nature of the interaction. It's just this minus mu, there should be a dot there, dot b, minus mu n. So that's the, that's the magnetic moment of the neutron dotted into the net magnetic field that it sees from all these sources. Okay. So I'm going to sort of jump to the result. Yes? I have Sorry, say that again? No, no, sorry. So, uh, yeah, so the question was, is the wave vector and the wavelength here uh, both in the cross-section? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, isn't it redundant? Yeah. Yeah, it would be, right. So here, the wavelength, the, the lambda here doesn't refer to the wavelength of the neutron. It refers to the state of the atom, of the state of, or the state of the, whatever it is you're scattering off. Yeah, so, so sorry, the, the uh, notation is not uh, uh, so consistent with the first uh, lecture. That, that's a good catch. Uh, right, so here lambda means, it's, it's lambda is the state of whatever it is that we're scattering off. So lambda is the initial state, and lambda prime is the final state. Okay. So you can see, so I've written out the cross-section in, in this particular way. Um, we've got, so these are the, the kinematic pieces. This tells you how strong the scattering is, and this is the kinematic piece. Uh, we've got this term here, which I'll come back to in a moment. This, is, um, this tells us a little bit about the polarization. Then we've got, uh, then we've got a piece which... Uh, is related to the spatial distribution of the magnetic electrons. It's referred to as the magnetic form factor. We've got an energy conserving uh, delta function over here. And here we've got these matrix elements, which I've now written out uh, explicitly. Uh, but uh, all I really want to show you here 
is that these matrix elements, again, they involve uh, the spin of the, of the electron uh, at position uh, D prime, if you like, and the spin uh, of, or the, the spin in the, in the system at D prime and the spin at the system at D. So at the end of the day, we're going to combine these two into another pair correlation function, but now it's going to be a spin pair correlation function, and these are where the spins come from. Okay. So I'm going to simplify this further, and this next simplification is actually using uh, this delta function. We transform this energy-conserving delta function into a, a, in, in, into a mathematically convenient form, okay, which I'm not going to really explain. Uh, but that, that actually lets me write um, the, uh, those matrix elements that I had before in terms of this correlation function. So this is the correlation function of uh, the, the spin or the magnetism at site zero. It's the alphath component, so x, y, z, alphath component of the spin at site zero and time zero, and the spin at site L, the beta component of the spin at site L and time t. So this is a spin pair correlation function, okay? And we're going to Fourier transform it in time. We're also gonna Fourier transform it in space, okay? Um, and we have kinematic factors out here. This is the magnetic form factor. This is the polarization factor, okay? But, um, so there, there's, there's several factors here, but most of the science of what we're interested in is in this dynamic spin pair correlation function and uh, if you do these Fourier transforms, we call this S of, it's S of Q and omega, or S of kappa and omega in this formulation. Okay. And so, so these, are the, these are the bottom lines, okay, um, that these parts out front here, this gamma and R naught, this tells us about the strength of the scattering from magnetic moments in solids, okay. This tells us that overall, we expect this magnetic scattering to be about the same strength as the scattering from the lattice. Okay, so it's not the case that the scattering from the lattice is strong and magnetic scattering is weak. Magnetic scattering can actually be stronger than the scattering from the lattice, at least in principle. Okay, and most of the time, it's about the same strength. So it's not inherently weak. Okay, so it's comparable in strength to the nuclear scattering or the scattering from the lattice. It depends on this magnetic form factor squared, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. It has this polarization factor in front of it, okay? This polarization factor actually is a consequence of the fact that um, the neutron has, the neutron's magnetic field, if you like, comes from its spin a half magnetic moment so, it, so the neutron has this little dipole magnetic field, sort of this bow tie magnetic field associated with it. And it interacts with the bow tie magnetic fields associated with the spins of the electrons. And that interaction is a dipole-dipole interaction. And that implies this polarization factor. Okay. Actually, if you understood that, great. Again, if you didn't, don't worry about it. The bottom line is that what this factor does is it says that magnetic neutron scattering can only see those components of magnetism in the solid that lie in a plane perpendicular to the momentum transfer. So for a given scattering event, there's a certain energy transfer, there's certain momentum transfer, okay? The components of magnetic moment that are parallel to the momentum transfer, neutrons don't see them. They only see the components of magnetism that lie in a plane perpendicular to Q or to kappa here. Okay. And you might think, oh, that's too bad. You know, we're missing out on the components of moments that lie you know, in, in the direction of momentum transfer. But actually, it's exactly the opposite. It's a good thing, because it means that even when you do an unpolarized magnetic neutron scattering experiment, you have a way of uh, determining, uh, you know, if you like, um, you know, the vector distribution of magnetic moments in your solid or how they're fluctuating. Okay, so it gives, you in, it, it gives you polarization information even when you're doing an unpolarized neutron scattering experiment. And if you do a polarized neutron scattering experiment, which I'm sure you'll be hearing about later on in the week, then you can get even more information. Okay. So, and, uh, and that S of Q and omega, 
you know, basically what S of Q and omega is made up of, it's made up of two terms that look like this. And it's a, it's a spin operator that connects the initial state of the sample to the final state. Okay? And this spin operator, okay, it's, uh, it's you know, SX, SY, or SZ. It's a, it's a dipole operator for the same reason that I gave before. And uh, so this, you can write SX and SY as these raising or lowering operators. Um, and uh, I'll show you some examples of this in just a minute. So for diffraction type experiments, if we're not doing inelastic scattering, for diffraction type experiments, then you know, essentially what we're going to be doing, you know, again, if we go back uh, here, for diffraction experiments, you know, omega is zero. Uh, and uh, you know, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be you know, adding up you know, so these are really equal time correlations. We're going to be, we're going to be looking at um, the correlation between the spin at uh, site zero and the spin at site L with some phase factor associated with it. Okay, so it's pretty easy to think about this. So if I just take those pieces out, I've got this. I've got a sum over sites in the lattice, exponential i, wave back, uh, or uh, momentum transfer kappa dot L, okay, the spin at site zero and time zero spin at site L and time T with T set to zero. So these are equal time correlations. Okay. Uh, then I've got the magnetic form factor. So this part here, the magnetic form factor. The magnetic form factor just tells us that when we have a magnetic moment associated with the, um, um, as associated with the unpaired electrons, okay, the unpaired electrons are actually, you know, uh, they're distributed around the, around the nucleus. They're, you know, about one or two angstroms away from the nucleus. It's, there's an electric, electron cloud that's associated with a, a given atom or a given ion, okay? And we're scattering the, the magnetism. The magnetism is not in the nucleus. It's in the electron cloud. And the electron cloud is distributed in space, okay? And so the fact that it's distributed in space uh, means that it's possible to diffract off, uh, not, off the, not off the nucleus, but off, off a region in space that's near the nucleus, say one angstrom away. And the fact that, that you have this distribution of the electron cloud okay, gives you, uh, if you Fourier transform that electron cloud, you get a function that looks like this, actually. It means that you really can only get constructive interference when you're down at small momentum transfers. So this is the scattering as a function of momentum transfer. Okay, it's written somewhat differently, but uh, that's, that's what it is. And, uh, you know, so this magnetic form factor, it really means that the constructive interference from magnetism will fall off on a uh, scale in momentum space that's given by pi divided by the approximate distribution. You know, how far are the electrons, the magnetic electrons, how far are they distributed away from the nucleus? Okay, so this pi means that You've got a pi phase shift, which means you have destructive interference, okay, you know, on a uh, on a spatial scale of one angstrom, and that's about three inverse angstroms, right? So this pi is about three, this is one, so it's three inverse angstroms. So if you if your momentum transfer for magnetic scattering extends beyond about three inverse angstroms, four inverse angstroms, then the scattering intensity will start to go down, and it's because of this magnetic form factor. It's because the magnetic electrons, they're not concentrated at the, at the nuclear position. They're distributed around the nuclear position. And that means they can interfere destructively with themselves, actually, across that distance. Okay. Right. So, uh, so once, you know, again, there's, there's sort of three, three ways we can do these sorts of experiments. We can look at explicitly at elastic scattering. We can look at energy integrated elastic scattering, and this is what a lot of diffraction is. Or we can look explicitly at inelastic scattering. So, um, so if we look at elastic scattering, you know, our cross section basically boils down to this. So this is the form factor. So this is going to just gradually fall off as a function of momentum transfer. This is the Debye-Waller factor, which we're not going to worry about at all because we're at low temperatures. This is that polarization dependence which we are going to worry about because it's going to tell us what the structure is, okay? And then, and then here we're just adding up the spins, um, 
you know, on the different lattice sites with this particular phase factor. We're, we're adding, we're, we're going to determine the magnetic structure by adding up the spins with a, an appropriate phase factor. And I'll have to show you an example to show you how that goes. So this is a very simple example, but they actually all work kind of the same way. So this is what you would get for um, a very, uh, it, I mean, actually this is, not, uh, this is not the simplest material to study, but it does have a very simple magnetic structure. It's uranium ruthenium to silicon two. And only one of the atoms here is magnetic. It's uranium is magnetic. Okay, and so it's the, it's the black, uh, the big black balls that are uh, uranium. And, uh, and the magnetic structure, I'll tell you what the magnetic structure is, okay, so we don't have to work it out. Okay, so the magnetic structure, it has this body center to trigonal structure, and the moments on the corners are all parallel to each other, but the moments in the middle are anti-parallel, okay? So it's a really simple structure. Okay, so we're just gonna use the rules that we have, and, uh, and I'm going to say, I'm just looking at this, so, so these all are, so these are all in phase with each other, and these are all in phase with each other. So I might guess that we would see Bragg uh, diffraction at the 0, 0, 001 position in reciprocal space. So this is the momentum transfer 0, 0, 001. So what does that mean if we go to the 0, 0, 001? So, so it means A star is equal to zero, B star is equal to zero. This is in reciprocal space. So A star and B star equal to zero means that whatever we have in the AB plane so this is the AB plane. Whatever we have in the AB plane, we just add it up in phase. The phase factor is zero, okay? So, th so that's good. So if we add these up in phase, we get a really big moment. If we add these up in phase, we get a really big moment. That's all good. And then C star is equal to one, okay? Which means that we have a two pi phase shift if we, if we add our spins up uh, over uh, the C lattice parameter. So, that's, so there's a two pi phase shift over here. Again, that's good, because that means that this stuff will add up in phase with this stuff. And if these are at, have a two pi phase shift, then this has a pi phase shift. And that's good, because that's going to flip, that pi phase shift means that we'll flip the spin. And it means that all these, all these magnetic moments, they all add up in phase. So on the basis of what I just told you, there should be strong constructive interference at the 0, 0, 001 position. Okay? But there isn't. Okay? And the reason there isn't is because at the zero, if Q is the zero, zero, 001 position, that means that our momentum transfer is pointing along here, and the moments are also pointing along there, and those are the moments that we don't see, right? So instead of seeing an enormous constructive interference peak, we see nothing, okay? So that's not a, that's not a good place to, to look. So instead, let's look at uh, 100, zero, zero. so not 001, zero, zero, let's look at 100. Zero, zero. So 100, zero, zero, it's going to be easier if we look at this from the top down. And from the top down, we've got these spins at the corners that are uh, all pointing in the same direction. The spin at the middle is pointing in the opposite direction. So now, and because the, the zero for the C star means that we're going to add everything together along C with the same phase. So just imagine it all being squashed together. So now 100 zero, zero means that uh, along the A direction, we're going to have a 2 pi phase shift across here. That's good, because that means these add up together, these add up together. And if this is 2 pi, then this is pi. So this will have a, a pi phase shift. So th then these will all add up together. Okay, so this will give you a nice big uh, net magnetic moment. But now the magnetic moment itself is perpendicular to our momentum transfer, so we do see these components of moment, so we will see a big uh, peak for constructive interference here. So that's one example of elastic neutron scattering. So now let's do a simple example for inelastic neutron scattering. And the simple example that I'm gonna do is for manganese two plus, it's the one that we did at the beginning. So that's the one where we had, uh, we had one electron pointing uh, spin up, in, uh, in, every, in every one of the uh, orbitals, right? So there are five, it, the orbitals were half filled. So there's five uh, spin a half electrons all pointing in the same direction. So you just add them up. So it's spin five half. So every manganese two plus ion has a spin five half magnetic moment. And, uh, and so these will, uh, these will in, 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 in zero magnetic field, 
These will give you 2s plus 1, uh, a 2s plus 1 degeneracy, so it's, if it's 5 halves, that's 6 states, okay? And these six states, they, they all correspond to different uh, Z component of uh, spin. So they all have a spin, total spin five halves, but they've got a Z component that's either you know, minus five halves, minus three halves, minus a half, a half, three halves, five halves. So if we're in a, if we're in a net magnetic field, we would split these up. Okay? Um, and now for inelastic scattering, you know, uh, if we were in a, a, a manganese-based solid, which had some sort of ordered phase. So the ordered phase, that, that net interaction, is actually a lot like applying a magnetic field. Okay? That net interaction will split the states up for a given um, manganese 2 plus ion like so. Okay? And so, manganese, uh, so, so the state with Jz equals 5 halves will be the ground state. Uh, and now, if we do inelastic scattering, we have these S plus and S minus operators uh, to make transitions from the ground state you know, to some of these excited states. But actually, the only one we can reach is this one, because a, a spin minus operator operating on spin, ha spin five halves gives you spin three halves. So our dipole operators can take us here. We can make this sort of transition. With the neutron makes this sort of transition at a given site, okay? because that's dipole allowed. That's allowed by these selection rules. So that's, that's the mechanism to get to inelastic scattering. So we have our you know, one-dimensional system, very simple. We've got our, we've got our manganese-based uh, one-dimensional ferromagnet with uh, you know, Jz equals five halves at each of these. But then the neutron comes in, and it creates a transition from five halves to three halves. Okay, so it comes in, it gives some energy to the system, and it leaves. Okay? And it's the same sort of idea as when I was talking about uh, you know, the motion of the atoms. If you take one of the atoms that's connected by all the springs and you sort of pluck it over to the side, you know, the atom doesn't vibrate independent of everything else. It's the same idea here. If the neutron puts a defect, so here's a defect on this one site, okay, the way we would say this in, uh, in physics is that this isn't an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian. This isn't allowed. Okay, you cannot select out one of these because they're all the same. And so what the system does instead is it takes this defect and it distributes it uniformly uh, along or among the entire system. So it doesn't put one big defect here. It puts the same sort of defect at every you know, site along the chain. And, and, uh, and then these, uh, the transverse components, these components you know, normal to this big direction here, uh, they will, you know, rotate uh, as, a, as a function of position to give you what's referred to as a spin wave, okay? So it's a, it's a local rotation of the magnetization in such a way as to form, uh, as to form this wave. And that's the, that's the low-lying excitation that the neutron will uh, produce, okay? So this is what these excitations would look like. Okay, this is what it looks like from the side. This is what it looks like from the top down. Okay, and um, you can you can sort of see that uh, if if the energy of the of the system, you know, looks like this. If this is what the Hamiltonian looks like, it's you know the so you you you'd like all the you'd like all the spins to be parallel. You know, you can sort of imagine that. Um, you know, the Z component or the Z component of spin is parallel, but this transverse component isn't, although they're, you know, the longer the wavelength of the excitation, the more parallel they get. You know, so long wavelength excitations will be relatively low energy, and wavelength excitations will be rather relatively high energy. Okay. And I would just say that this, you know, so this is all embodied in, in S of Q and omega or S of kappa and omega. So if we measure S of kappa and omega, you know, we're, we're basically measuring this. And we can relate this to what's referred to as uh, an imaginary part of the dynamic susceptibility. And the imaginary part means that it's an energy absorbing part of the dynamic susceptibility. So, uh, so that's just related to the fact that we're doing inelastic neutron scattering and uh, the system, our, our sample, is absorbing energy from the neutron. The neutron is putting the spin wave on the, on the sample. Okay. But more importantly, this is a, 
momentum transfer and energy transfer dependent magnetic susceptibility. Okay? So you guys you know, uh, if you're involved in magnetism at all, uh, you know, one of your baseline measurements of any material is its magnetization or its susceptibility. Okay? So the susceptibility that you measure in a squid or a vibrating sample magnetometer or, you know, these sorts of things that you do in your lab, and this susceptibility, they're related to each other. They're not different. Right? And, um, and so this DC susceptibility is actually given by an integral of the dynamic susceptibility that we measure with neutrons, okay, but with the momentum transfer set to zero, and we integrate over all energies. Okay? But the, the real point here is that the susceptibility or the magnetization that you measure in your own lab with a squid and the neutron scattering signal that you measure with inelastic neutron scattering, okay, they're, they're, you know, they're both magnetic susceptibilities. They're related to each other. They're not independent. Okay. Okay. The other thing is that the total scattering from your sample is actually determined by how much magnetism is in your sample. Okay? Not so surprising. Okay? But uh, if, you, if, you, if you were able to do this, and it's not necessarily all that easy to do, but if you're able to integrate over all energies and over one um, primitive unit cell of the reciprocal lattice, one Brillouin one zone, if you were to integrate S of Q of omega over, over all that region of uh, energy and momentum space, that has to give you back you know, S times S plus one uh, uh, appropriate for a single uh, unit cell in your magnetic system. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so, I mean, that's telling you that if you have a, a, a magnetic system based on very quantum mechanical magnetic moments, spin a half magnetic moments, like we had in the parent compound for high temperature superconductivity, there the magnetism corresponded to spin a half so the, the strength of the scattering, if, 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 I have a, if I have a sample of lanthanum cuprate and I have the same size sample of lanthanum manganate, okay, not that it, I don't even know if it exists, uh, but, uh, but uh, maybe it does. So, so lanthanum cuprate, so the copper has a spin a half magnetic moment, the manganese has a spin five halves magnetic moment. It's five times bigger. Okay, the scattering from the manganese sample will be about 25 times uh, stronger. Okay, and it's because the magnetic moment is just bigger. So the strength of the scattering goes like the moment squared. Okay, I'm not going to bother with this. And uh, yeah, so I just say that uh, you know th this is uh, you know s somewhat more uh, uh, modern uh, you know data. Uh, again, these are. Uh, these are here, here you've got a measurement. These are uh, spin waves in a magnetic field uh, measured actually with the DCS spectrometer. So this is energy versus a particular direction in, in reciprocal space. But this sort of data is actually you know, extracted from a four-dimensional data set. Right? So this is the same sort of thing that I was telling you before. At the end of the day, when you do these sorts of experiments, if you, if you do a complete set of experiments, you end up with a four-dimensional data set, which can easily be two terabytes okay, across. And so even to visualize the data, right? So, so this is, uh, I'm not sure if I've got a, yeah. So you know, this, is, th this is what some of this uh, data would look like. Um, so we've got, th this is data here. These are calculations, okay? And uh, so, so this data, these are all different directions in reciprocal space, okay? Because you know you've got you've got this enormous data set, you know it's three dimensions in momentum space, one dimension in energy, so so we've cut out we, uh, we've cut out different uh, pieces of it, and we show what the what the excitations look like in energy and different directions in momentum space. We get together with some theory colleagues and they calculate what we should see based on assumptions for the microscopic Hamiltonian, and if you do this, and so this is getting back to a question that I had back over there. I'm not even sure if you're still there, but uh, about you know, is it important to get you know just the just the dispersion, or do you want to get the intensities as well? You want to get the intensities as well, because the calculation actually gives you both, and you can do this very hard comparison that I was talking about before, and uh, 
And uh, right, and, and so if you do that, you know, what you get at at the end of the day is, uh, you know, you can, you can you know, estimate at least the microscopic Hamiltonian. And once you've got the microscopic Hamiltonian, you can turn that over to your theory friends and to the rest of the community. And actually, if you've got the microscopic Hamiltonian correctly, if you've got it, if you've got it down accurately, they, there's, nothing, there's nothing else. You know, they can calculate everything from that. Right? So at, when you get to that point, the problem is solved. So yeah, so that's, that's pretty much all I really wanted to say. And I'll just end there. Sorry, the, the magnetic portion and the what, sorry? Yes, yes it is, yeah. So, uh, so, if, so I think the question was, when you do these experiments, are you, uh, are you, are you looking at uh, both the scattering from the, the magnetism and the lattice? And uh, so this is what I started off with. Um, and I was just saying that, uh, you know, because of this magnetic form factor dependence, the scattering from magnetism, so, so in this data, this is a particular cut of data uh, where you've got scattering at small momentum transfer here and at large momentum transfer here. So you scatter off your sample, and if your sample, so your sample has to have uh, a lattice, it has to have nuclei, oh sorry, I, I forgot who I was talking to, <laughs> has to have a nuclei. Uh, but there's also magnetism there, so you'll scatter off both. And you'll, see the mag you'll tend to see the magnetism at relatively small wave vectors because of the form factor, and you'll tend to see the phonons at relatively high momentum transfer because the phonon cross-section, uh, I don't know if you remember it, but it goes like uh, the eigenvector dot Q squared. So it actually gets bigger with Q squared. So, but you measure from your sample, right? So the neutron doesn't know you know, whether it's supposed to scatter off the magnetism or off the lattice, it scatters off both. Now you can isolate them by, if you did polarization analysis, you can, you can isolate the magnetism from the lattice, but in general you measure both. 